Welcome back to the channel. Today, Altar of Freedom. So, Altar of Freedom is a 6mm, which is how big these minis are. Uh, brigade level game, well, I suppose. This is a, a brigade uh, made by. I can't remember who it's made by, but it's made by the guys who do Little Wars TV. Uh, one of the guys on that on that uh, team in that group uh, made this game. So it's it's yeah, it's got a, a famous author, and you can see it being played over on Little Wars. I think they did a giant Gettysburg game uh, with these rules. They may have done others, but uh, anyways, for those who don't know how this works, five things I like, three things that well, I don't maybe I don't dislike them, but they're they're not my favorite thing about the uh, about the game or things I sort of. Uh, can't understand or sort of tweak when I personally uh, play and then something at the end which is very interesting and unique and special about the game that makes it different to other things so just before we get in uh, six millimeter is a, is a weird scale for a lot of people who don't really know what it is this is a Primaris Marine that's the six millimeter so it's just above the lip of a sort of GW base um, I don't think I have anything else around handy to show, but uh, the 6mm is quite small. Um, so let's get on with the video. Number one, it's standard basing and there is no figure removal. Uh, there is base removal, but there's not figure removal because it's all on one little base. That's a unit. Um, that's as big as a unit's ever going to be. Uh, it's as small as a unit's ever going to be. All you need is just 24 dudes or however many guys you want. Uh, on a base, these are 60 by 30. That's what the book suggests, but it's not what you have to do. Uh, I noticed that uh, what is it? The Palomos rule set by Bacchus is based on the same base size, so I figured, well, I'll do that, and that seems to be the industry standard, and that seems to be the you know, works for both games. Haven't felt the need to play the Bacchus one, but I'm sure it's it's not bad. So it's the, the one of the best things about standard basing is you can just put your stuff on the base, paint it up, make it look nice. Some people put skirmishes in front. Uh, all my cavalry are staggered, so instead of being in a line, they're sort of, you know, different, different, separate to one another. Uh, you can really make little dioramas. Uh, I've, I'll put some pictures up, but I've got uh, skirmish bases to represent a sort of more loose brigade, maybe a smaller brigade in skirmish. Um, dismounted cavalry, uh, combined infantry cavalry brigades, that sort of thing. You really have fun with it. And not having to have, I know they're from different sides, but you know, not having to have three in a row, then I move around and, oh, well, I take this one off and now I've got two, and then I take that one off and I've got one. It, it, it's just so much better, and I much prefer uh, multi games like that uh, to not have figure removal. I think it's much better. Number two. The priority point system. So I'll put a picture up here. This is from a free scenario they give out online, so I'm assuming it's okay to use. Uh, different generals, who all have things, but we'll get to that later, um, have different priority points. And what a priority point is, is basically like a bidding system. So uh, in one scenario, Grant has 20, but he's the only commander on the field, but anyway. So if you have five priority points and two divisions, what you can do is you can then say, um, one division, which is, could be three, four, five brigades. Uh, I'm going to give them three priority points and the other one two. And that means that the unit with three is going to activate before the unit with two. And if your opponent gives out two and one, your third will go first, the seconds, and then the one. So it's sort of, it's a way to, um, to get things moving on the tabletop. And instead of just having an I go, you go game or a random draw game, you have limited amount of points which you can spend on allocating you know literally priority to the units I'm prioritizing this unit here I'm gonna give them 10 priority points wouldn't recommend that but you can do it uh, you can also save them for the end of the turn to activate units but it's not as good and it's not as uh, it's better to do it during the turn uh, and we'll get to why you shouldn't you're not going to just give everybody one point at the end but anyway the priority point system and the bidding system is quite good. It forces you to assess the whole battlefield at the start of every turn. Uh, a lot of games you can hyper-focus on something and say, 
Uh, so I've got to take a bridge or something like there's a bridge where if I take it, I can cut the enemy off. And I just, you laser focus in on the bridge and you forget that there's like a flank you could push or there's an enemy crossing from another bridge somewhere else that you have to deal with. And this way you can say, right, I'm going to prioritize that bridge. But at the same time, I have to look at everything else and what am I going to allocate to these guys? And how important is this unit in the middle? Who's not really going to do anything this turn. Do I want to just activate them at the end? Do I want to skip them? Do I want to give them some activation, but very low down on the priority scale? It's, a, it's quite an interesting system and I really like it. Number three, it's got a Civil War vibe. <laughs> it, the book is, is, is fantastic. It's, it's quite short, which is good. And it's written, obviously, by people who very much care about the Civil War and very much care about history in general. Um, the, the bit on fortifications is very clever, the way they've done this. So uh, for later games, sort of 63, 64, 65, uh, brigades can build a fortification in front of them. It's quite simple. You just, I'm making a fortification with this unit. If nobody does anything to them, I now have a fortification at the end of the turn. And the turn represents about an hour. And it took, in the, in the book, it actually has a quote there from a, I think it's a French, I'm assuming it's a French person, his name, uh, saying, the Americans are fantastic, they can build fortifications in about 45 minutes, which is quite clever to put in there, seeing as the turn is an hour, proving that the fortifications can actually be built. So not only is it Civil War themed, they've proved it in the rule. There's far more than just that too. All the generals have personality traits. Um, some of them like to lead from the front, which gives morale bonuses, but you're more likely to be killed. Um, that's off the top of my head, sorry if that's wrong. Some of them are micromanagers. That's, I think it's the scenario I'm looking at is Shiloh, and Johnson is a micromanager. So he, can, he has six priority points to allocate, but three of them have to be done at the end of the turn, micromanaging things. So he's not a big picture, giving much priority points out type guy which uh, I'm not an expert on Johnson and Albert City Johnson, but I assume that reflects his character in the real war. Uh, different generals have different rules. Some of them are fantastic. Some of them suck. <laughs> some of them are, are positive. Some are negative. Some are sort of neutral. And the, the feel behind that is just really nice. Uh, the, the dedication that's gone into this rule set really does shine through. Number four, there's no passive player. So again, not a back and forwards type game, not an I go, you go game. There's no, it's my turn, it's your turn. Uh, not, it isn't even really turns, but we'll get to that later. It is a game of that includes reactions. So if you get too close to somebody, they can react. Um, this stops, for instance, uh, if you're moving, here we go. If, the, if a unit moves within two inches of another unit, that's when shooting starts. And the unit which moves in shoots last, because obviously it's moving into range and the other unit gets to shoot at it first. So attacking another unit is, is, puts you at a disadvantage, but at the same time it means you're taking the initiative and you're sort of picking where your fights are. And you can gang up on a unit. Um, you can't put two units in and fire them both at once, but you can fire one then fire another. So there's, there's, a, there's, there's pros and cons to each way of doing things. And the... No passive player who can just go out and get a coke and then come back, uh, like some games have. Uh, although it's becoming less and less of a thing, but it, it can be a big issue sometimes where one person is just not touching dice for 20 minutes at a time. Uh, I, so I really like that it keeps you engaged. Number five, support and scenarios. So uh, you can go to, I think it's a 6 acwcom a bunch of free scenarios. You can buy... Uh, campaign books. I know you can get free campaigns and then you can buy scenario books uh, which are dirt cheap and you can get as PDFs so it's good it's good quality and good good fun. Um, the book itself you can get in hard copy or PDF. I got a PDF because shipping to Australia is, is ruinously expensive. It's, it, it'll, it'll crush you so PDFs it is uh, for a lot of stuff for me. Uh, which is fine. At least they offer it in a PDF or a hard copy. You get a choice. Uh, the support is fantastic. Um, th there are places where you can ask for queries on rules. Uh, you can see the game being played by the creator on Little Wars TV. I wish I could remember his name. I can't at the moment. Um, just, you, the game has support, has scenarios. Um, miniatures are available all over the place. These are irregular 6mm. So 6mm miniatures from irregular miniatures which again, Australia's really only supplier of 6mm is irregular. 
Um, there, there's nothing wrong with them. They're smaller than Bacchus. They're a little bit off than Bacchus, but I, I, I really kind of prefer them now that I've uh, that I've built giant armies with them. Uh, I got these for my six millimeter Napoleonics as well, which are the same things. They're brigades, but they're on hundred by hundreds instead of sixty by thirties. Anyway, that's way off tangent. Um, there's heaps of support. There's tons of scenarios. It's not hard to build your own scenarios. You really just need the order of battle, which you can get on Wikipedia or you know a book or something like that. And it's quite easy to to figure it out and run a game of Ultra of Freedom. Three things which are a little bit you know they're not really my my style my thing. Number one, the cavalry. Uh, cavalry really don't have that much of a movement advantage over infantry. I think it's about four inches, which you know maybe that's a struggle for for a tabletop game. Uh, cavalry should be quite you know I've, I'm used to cavalry being at least two thirds faster than infantry, not just you know sort of a third, at least half as fast. So sometimes in our games we bump the cavalry movement up. Uh, cavalry have a rule where if they get within six inches of someone. You have to reveal the your opponent has to reveal who that is. So you get within six inches of a, of a brigade. Your opponent says that's this brigade. Now that's useful. Um, say if a division has three brigades in it, they've been you, you obviously know which division is which because the division commanders can only add, give influence to their own their own uh, divisions. So you can sort of say, okay, I sort of know who they are. I can look at the sheet and say, okay, well I know they've got some. Some brigades which are overstrength and some which are understrength. Okay, you know, this one's got all understrength brigades, so it doesn't really matter. So, cavalry can be useful in a scouting role like that. But um, one, one rule that I've tried is if the cavalry are behind you, so there's cavalry in your rear, you're at negative one to rally, which means you can't fully rally and you're at a bigger chance of being sort of destroyed. Um, uh, it just sort of represents. You know, cavalry behind us, a little bit of chaos. Uh, maybe negative wonder rally is a little harsh. I don't know. Uh, can't really make anything bigger than you know anything smaller than negative one. But uh, that's a rule I've tried in a few games, and it seems to have worked out. Um, obviously, there were very small. There are very few units of cavalry in those games. I imagine with more, it might get a little ridiculous. But uh, yes, yeah, so there's cavalry behind you, a little bit harder to rally. Number two, resource allocation. So. I, I know I praise the priority point system, but resource allocation can become a little bit of a game within a game. And uh, I'm not a fan of games within games. I think games should just be games. They shouldn't have, like, the, the, the one I, I really dislike is the Game of Thrones game, Song of Ice and Fire game, whatever, which has the little board on the side where you put the special characters up there who have nothing to do with the battle, but you can sort of get re-rolls from something someone's doing a thousand miles away, which is, yeah, I, I find that a bit silly. Um, and sometimes resource allocation can become a little bit of a game within a game. Uh, so I, I'm always wary of things that that happen off the tabletop, that influence the tabletop. I'm always wary of, um, you know, uh, having a handful of cards that you can choose from. And that sort of becomes about, I'm going to manage my hand rather than managing my army. Um, the priority point system is not that bad because the whole attention is on the army based on the priority point system. But occasionally some people can really get gamey with it and and it, it, it does sort of it, do, it does sort of make me a bit hesitant but I've not run into any issues with it number three that you can't really combine fire or assaults with units I uh, fully understand why they did this if you could do that you'd have to rechange a whole bunch of rules that would just get way out of, out of hand um, so I'm not advocating for that to be changed. I actually agree with what's been done. But I've run into a few people. Uh, I had a game with someone a while ago who basically said, it's ridiculous that I can't double assault. Like, I can't put two brigades into one of yours at the same time. I have to go one, resolve, finish that, another, resolve, finish that. And, you know, that, that, I can see that being quite a valid point. Um, the counterpoint is this represents an hour of time. Two brigades can assault the same thing in, in you know, an hour. That's a lot of time to get into a firefight with someone. So, what's the big thing about this game that makes it special? Well, it's the turn clock. So, the turn clock is essentially how long the turn lasts. It might sound quite simple, but it's actually interesting and, 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 and a little tricky to first figure out. But I, I, after a few, I feel a few times you really do get it. 
The turn clock is a D12 or a D10 or a D20, depending on the scenario. The turn clock is different, and the way it works is uh, it goes back to the resource allocation thing. So you can allocate influence points to the turn clock to try and get control of it. And having control over the turn clock is actually quite useful. So, for example, say you're in a scenario where you've just got to hold a position for four turns. You want to run that clock down as fast as possible, literally running it down as fast as you can. And your opponent obviously wants to not run it down as fast as possible, keep it as high as he can. So, after you resolve a, a um, say you've got control of the turn clock and you want to extend the game for as long as possible, you allocate some points to it, whatever, and then you've allocated four points to one division, two to another, and then one to one other one. Okay, so when the four comes up, your opponent hasn't allocated any to the four, um, you act with that division, and then you roll for the turn clock. And the way the turn clock works is, each player rolls a d6, and that gets taken away from the clock. So, for example, say the clock is on 12, you roll a six, they roll a one, I'm going to say, ah, it's going to go down by one. So it goes down to 11. Uh, the next time, so it goes from, that was level 4, now we go to anyone with 3 influence points gets to activate. And so your opponent has 4 divisions with 3 influence. So they move all those divisions around, basically the whole army moves forward. You haven't got any with 3, so you roll on the clock again, and you roll 2 sixes. Okay, so you have to go down by 6. So now you're on so 5 on the turn clock. Uh, you go down to your, your division with 2, sorry if this is confusing, but it's really the only way to describe it. You activate your division with two influence, move it around, do whatever, shoot, assault, uh, do whatever you want to do, march on roads, and then you roll two dice again, this time it's a five and a six. So the turn clock is run out. Um, no matter what dice you pick, it's going to run out. Obviously, if it's a six and a one, you could pick the one and then keep going. But when the turn clock runs out, that's the end of the turn. Uh, very similar to what Sharp Practice does in the Lardy's game, Lardy games do, but not the same, but, but similar, in that if you've got influence points on units, gone. This is where your banked influence comes into use. So the influence you have banked over, uh, you allocate influence to be saved at the end of the turn, now you can start micromanaging stuff. You can start activating individual units and, and sort of get things moving, but not in the way you can with straight up influence. So sometimes those brigades you've only given one influence to, those divisions you've only given one influence to, might not actually get to activate this turn if the clock goes bad for you. Um, maybe you maybe you want to deliberately try and do that by putting 5, 4, 3, 2, and 1, so you're guaranteed to get 5 rolls on the turn clock. And 5 rolls on a 10 turn turn clock, you're going to run it down. Uh, so then you're forcing your opponent to put more influence either into the end of the game or the middle of the game. Uh, that sort of thing. So you can see how the game within a game really comes into it, but uh, at the same time uh, You have to be very careful with your influence. So I really quite like the turn clock. I think it's a great way to judge time I'm not a fan of this whole turn thing the Games Workshop seems to have invented or whatever I, I don't know Games Workshop has massively popularized this idea that there is a turn and that it, this is a turn at the end of this turn we start the next turn because it really sort of it sets the thing too too firmly. Uh, that's why the two fat Lardis game sharp practice. You can play a whole game and the turn never ends. It's just turn one the whole time, because the uh, or the chapter never ends. It's just different different goes, different deck shuffles. Uh, same with chain of command. The turn might not end. Oh, turn chain of command. The turn normally ends a lot faster. But anyway, games. I like games that the turn is not just. The, the one sequence of moving your army and then nothing happens because sometimes turns can be more than that and it's uh, it's it's just nice to see more exploration of that concept so thank you very much for watching uh, i'm going to do a bit more of the ultra of freedom uh, content on this channel quite soon i'm going to paint up some i believe i'm going to paint up some some union infantry because i've got those left over so i might film that uh, go through how i base things uh, look at um how I've built my stuff and uh, I'm going to do they've got this sort of five minute battle report thing I think it's under 10 minute battle report thing that that uh, Little Wars is doing so I might have a go at one of those let's see if I can find an opponent otherwise I might just sort of see what I, see what I can do but I, I would like to find someone around me I know some guys around here let's just see if uh, lockdown's permitting that works 
So keep if you've enjoyed this, let me know in the comments below because I can do a bit more Ultra Freedom content on the channel. Thank you very much for watching, everybody. Have a wonderful day.